Aloha, I'm Dan Figleith, and I'm welcoming you to Pigments, the Power of Imagination. Fig, that's my nickname, Pigments of the Imagination, uh, the Power of Imagination, rather, is intended to highlight things that go from fantasy to reality through hard work and perseverance. Uh, but today, this is a special edition. That's right, a special edition of Figments. So you can see we got three hot topics that I think need to be talked about. And I'd like to provide a perspective that maybe you haven't heard before. Why me? <laughs> I ask myself that question very often as I do the show. I'm no genius, but I've been around the world. I served in the Air Force for 33 years. I was blessed to be a fighter pilot, saw much of the world, uh, saw some combat, which influences a lot of my thinking, and worked at a pretty senior level as a three-star general. I later did uh, some work in the international arena here in the Asia Pacific region. And so I think I've got a perspective that might be of value. I know I'm not right about everything. I'm right about a few things, but I want to uh, engage in a non-political discourse, uh, throw some ideas out there and see what you think. And I'd love to hear what you th think by getting an email from you at info at phase minus one.com. Info at phase-one.com. You can visit my website, drop me an email, but let me know what you think, where I'm going, because I think we're at a critical time uh, in the world. There's so much going on that is, uh, represents several inflection points in domestic and international relations that we ought to be very thoughtful as citizens, because this stuff is going to affect our future a lot. Again, I strive to be non-political. Um, and more practical, I'm fascinated by things that work and not very interested in things that don't work very well. And I know I'm not special because I'm gonna talk very briefly about somebody who was special. Uh, this past week, we lost Admiral Ron Zapp Zlatiper, uh, former PAC fleet commander, a man of tremendous influence here in Hawaii and in industry and in education. And, and besides that, one of the best human beings I've ever known. And um, I'm gonna miss him. But he told me how much, taught me how much I have to learn and to do. And that's why I do things like pigments. So rest in peace, Zap, you earned it. Okay, let's get a little more lighthearted because this is lighthearted. My last two jobs in the Air Force as a three star general, I was the vice commander of Air Force Base Command and the deputy commander of uh, US Pacific Command, now known as Indo Pacific Command. Uh, for two weeks, uh, two glorious weeks, I was the acting commander of PACOM. But for the last several years, I was number two. In, and I know, therefore, that there's a lot of number two in being number two. That said, I'm sympathetic with the vice president of the United States who tested positive for COVID. Okay, that's bad enough. But then the White House released a statement that she was not considered a close contact with her boss, the president. I'm sorry, Vice President Harris, that's just not a good look. Not a good statement by the press secretary either. So, about a number two and be a number two. So let's strive to be number one. The first topic I wanna to talk about is Ukraine. And as I talk today about the three topics, maybe more if I have time, I wanna emphasize three words, humanity, diplomacy, and liberty, because they're pretty important words. And that helps me organize what I'm going to say. If we look at the Ukraine, the humanity of it is really sad, tragic, truly tragic. Uh, 12 million out of, I think, 44 million people in Ukraine displaced. 12 million people's lives are absolutely, totally changed and will never be the same. And they're not changed for the better. 12 million people. Now add to that the death, the destruction, the tragic situation. Um, having said that, there are reasons that could make you feel optimistic if you don't want the Russian forces to prevail. The, the sinking of the missile cruiser Moscow, the largest combatant sunk since World War II. And I'm going to assume that the, uh, the Ukraine played a role in that, though we really don't know. The uh, sort of withdrawal to the east and south by the Russians, the problems that the Russians are clearly having. The fires at Russian oil refineries, which may or may not be caused by Ukraine. Uh, that looks pretty good, Russia's failing. Russia does not look like a 
any kind of a competent military power right now. But if their goals are still just to control the Donbass region and uh, deny access to black, have access for themselves to black seaports and deny it to Ukraine, they don't have to take Kiev or anywhere else other than the Donbass and the area along the Black Sea. So they're losing and winning at the same time. And meantime, people are suffering. And it, the US, by and large, has done what? And I'm going to say this with a bit of hyperbole intentionally and then, and then refine what I've said. We're funding the death and destruction. We're supplying it. We're providing weapons and missiles and stuff. Now, there's a place for that. We don't want Russia to succeed. And the Ukrainians has, have asked for weapons. But is that really where our focus should be? Certainly not our sole focus. And do we know where these billions of dollars of aid are going? Hashtag Afghanistan. Look back at what happened to the arms we supplied there. So the supplying of weaponry may be absolutely necessary. It ought not be the end game. And I don't even think it should be our focus. And uh, the focus should be on medical and humanitarian assistance with reasonable and well-controlled uh, uh, provision of lethal capabilities. Again, I'm not, not against it. I just don't think it should be our focus. Look at Afghanistan. Um, on a brighter note, well, let me start with a dim note and a brighter note, then a brighter note. Um, Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin visited uh, Ukraine. It's about damn time. It's about damn time. This hands-off approach where we're just throwing stuff at the problem, I don't think is uh, very competent. It doesn't work very well. But they visited, uh, met with President Zelensky, and uh, came away from there with a couple of major outcomes, one bad, one good, first the bad. Following that meeting, the uh, Secretary of Defense said our goal was to weaken Russia. What the heck, because this might be a family show. <laughs> My reaction initially was a lot stronger. Oh, hi, why would you say that? Our goal isn't to weaken Russia. It shouldn't be anyway. <laughs> And I can't imagine anything that would further feed, would better feed internal propaganda in Russia than saying we're trying to uh, weaken this country that already has a bit of an inferiority complex. Come on, man. Why would you say that, Secretary Austin? We should have three goals. One, reduce human suffering, first and foremost, most urgent. Two, get Russia out of Ukraine. That has to be the goal. Russia leaves Ukraine, not Russia gains uh, uh, control of the Black Sea ports and, and the full Donbass region, out of Ukraine. And three, we deter them from future adventurism in Ukraine and elsewhere. Now, that deterrence may involve some weakening of the forces, but that weakening of the Russian military is not the goal, I hope. <laughs> that got me exercised, energized, and irritated. It pissed me off. So check, uh, but there's some better news. And th that this next bit, I think, reflects some uh, new competency in the diplomatic efforts of the Biden administration. And I've alluded to what I see as failures of competence or incompetence on other shows. But now they are restarting diplomatic efforts. They're going to reopen the embassy in Kyiv. And Ambassador uh, Bridget Brink, interesting name in this case, um, uh, the current US ambassador to Slovakia has been nominated to be the ambassador to the Ukraine. And I think that's awesome. Uh, I think it's trying to correct a mistake too. In Afghanistan and in Ukraine, the first thing we did when the fecal matter hit the ventilation system is withdraw diplomat. Okay, I understand the sensitivity uh, coming from the death of our ambassador in Libya and others, but the last thing to go should be diplomacy in time of crisis. I know a lot of our great State Department professionals, diplomats, 
other folks in the State Department apparatus, and uh, we need them in time of crisis. The, the last thing to happen should be a withdrawal of our diplomat. And instead, under two different administrations, it's become the first three, three actually. So now we've got a diplomatic presence restarted there, and I'm hopeful for that. That said, it's still a dire situation, and we can't lose fact but lose sight of the fact that 12 million people have been displaced. Many thousands have died on both sides because I am you know, a moral absolutist. Uh, yeah, Elon Musk, that's a, that's a uh, nod to you as a free speech absolutist. And every life matters. And any life, loss of human life unnecessarily, especially in war, is a tragedy that we ought to seek to avoid. So, Let's uh, pray that the diplomatic initiatives and the strength provided to military strength provided to Ukraine uh, prevails and that we achieve those three goals, which once again are in this suffering, Russia out of Ukraine and deter further aggression. Okay, let me take a breath from that and tell you that I'll be back soon in six days with another edition of Figment's The Power of Imagination. This, this will be special, but it won't be a special edition. May 2nd, I'm going to have Clint Churchill, former Air National Guard pilot and commander here in Hawaii. Clint's an amazing guy, a great friend, and one of the founders of the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. And I want to help you imagine history you can feel. Now, full disclosure, I'm a member of the board at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, and I had my retirement party from the Air Force. Uh, there geez, many years ago, uh, but you're going to love this. Clint's story is so interesting, and uh, there is history you can feel right there on Fort Island, America's World War II battlefield. So I hope you'll join me for that May 2nd, 2 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. The rest of you do the math. All right, what's the next topic? China and COVID. Um, you may remember, uh, you should remember, because I've reminded you many times that I was right on December 6th when I said that the emergence of Omicron as the principal variant of COVID marked the end of the pandemic. I was right. And, and the reason I said that was it was so highly infectious, so much less lethal, and uh, that it was going to mark the end of the pandemic and that the, the COVID uh, infections would become uh, endemic. And in fact, CDC announced today that 60% of Americans have COVID antibodies. All right, 60%. Here in our house, we've wondered if we already had COVID and don't know, it's entirely possible. But that was the end of the pandemic. There's something else I said that may not have gotten as much attention because it wasn't so obviously right at the time. And that's that China would be first in and last out regarding the pandemic. What do I mean by that? They were first in because the virus originated there. And I don't care to debate what happened in Wuhan or, or how it could, we don't know. But that's where the virus started. Uh, when it started there, uh, the Chinese were very successful at controlling it internally, didn't care much about it, controlling it externally and allowed it to. Uh, leave with thousands, tens of thousands of passengers, travelers from China. But internally, they were very successful. How were they successful? Through a COVID zero uh, uh, or zero COVID policy, where they would squash every infection like a bug. I don't, the way I mean that is, they tried to limit the infections to zero through aggressive testing, isolation, quarantine, reporting, et cetera. And it seemed to work. I mean, I think it would be reasonable to view Chinese uh, numbers skeptically and wonder if maybe there weren't a few more than the, the reported infections, but generally it worked well and life was relatively normal for those in China until this year, mostly, until Omicron when in Jinlin province and later Shanghai, the, the uh, virus made a very dramatic emergence resulting in 
significant and oppressive lockdown. Now, the reason I said that they'd be last out was that Omicron, being so contagious, doesn't care about China's zero COVID policy. That's part one. Part two is the zero COVID policy is simply not compatible with, with long-term control of an, inspection, of an infection because the way they made it zero COVID was to have strict controls, strict isolation, strict quarantine, strict testing, and high consequences for those who failed, local officials, in, um, in controlling the virus. So if you're the mayor of, we'll call it Green Bay, there's probably a Green Bay somewhere in China. If you're the mayor of Green Bay, China, and Green Bay, China has five or six COVID infections show up, here's what happens to you. You get fired, fired, you're fired. It rings a bell for some reason. But the local officials who had incidences of COVID were relieved, taken out of office. Now, certainly that gets everybody's attention, but not in the way one might hope. If you're the mayor of, let's say, Milwaukee, China, just to use another generic name, and uh, you see what happens to the mayor of Green Bay, China, are you going to report infection? No, you're going to suppress accurate reporting. You're going to hide it until it's too late. And I believe that's what's happened in China is that the fear and loathing of the local officials led to hiding of significant infections until they, they expanded. And when you add that to the nature of the Omicron virus, you've got kind of big trouble that we see in Shanghai before that Jinmen province and now in uh, Beijing. Let's see if China learns from the failures in Shanghai and Jinmen. And the human tragedy, I mean, it's a, it's a human tragedy. I won't go over some of the draconian measures that the Chinese have had. I will read from the 24th, 25th of April, Time Magazine, an article called Parents in China Protest COVID Child Separation. Protest in China, risky business. But here's, here's the, the important sentence. For many Chinese people, the fear of getting COVID-19 is not about getting sick. It's about having to submit to China's strict pandemic measure. There you have it. That's not good for China. So I hope they learn and adjust and take a more humane approach to addressing the virus. Now they can do what they do because they're a very authoritarian, authoritarian form of government, but no, no authoritarian leader has absolute power. Absolute power in the modern era of information sharing is a myth, just doesn't exist. What does this mean for, for the long term for China? Uh, first of all, it means internal unrest, and that's bad. Because in addition to these very uh, strict and you have to read them to believe them, the, the, horrible measures that are leading to food shortages and medicine shortages and so on and so forth. Um, the economy is being stifled by it and any failure of the economy in China to progress leads to social unrest, which leads to more repression or perhaps distraction. So what I worry about is that approaching the 20th Party Congress, a very important event this fall in China, that that uh, Xi Jinping may be compelled to launch his own October surprise, ignore the lessons he should have gathered from, um, from Russia's adventure, misadventure in Ukraine, and launch military act action against Taiwan. I think that'd be tragic on every level for China and for Taiwan, and a huge mistake. But will he be compelled to distract uh, his internal constituency. That I hope not. So absolute power, not a good thing. And the uh, application of it in China is a lesson we should all learn from. We should learn from it because it's possible here in the U US people, it really is. Um, another thing that 
pissed me off this week was when I heard Dr. Fauci's remarks on the court decision that lifted the mask mandate for uh, transportation in airplanes, airports, buses, et cetera, trains. Not automobiles, though we do see some people who think that it applies to automobiles. So Dr. Fauci, the director of the National Institute for, of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, who's become the central, central figure of this pandemic, said that he found it disturbing that the federal court would rule against the CDC's COVID-19 travel mask mandate. It was his opinion that this was not judicial map because they're the experts, right? Obviously, and understandably, Dr. Fauci was not a political science major and doesn't know jack anything about the American system of government and the separation of powers. Yes, it's a legal matter. Okay, I don't know what the right decision is on, uh, on masks, but I do know this. We are a nation of laws, and those laws govern our behavior. And if a judge in the judicial branch finds something that somebody in the executive branch where CDC resides, incompatible with our laws. Despite the consequences, they are compelled to uh, overrule. And they, and they did, this judge did. They agree with the judge or don't. That's the way our, separate, our, our uh, system of governance works. And the Fauci, as a longtime government employee, doesn't understand that it just drives me crazy. And there is danger with the overreach of government power throughout the COVID pandemic, that this will become the norm, that the CDC or some other element of the executive branch, without law from the legislative branch, will say, do this, do that, or else, and it won't be addressed properly by the judicial, by, by the judicial branch or anything else, won't be controlled. It'll be the kind of absolute power that is creating the human tragedy in, uh, that we're seeing in China. It's a, Shanghai is a human tragedy, folks. Take a look. So what would Fig do? Hey, don't let that happen here. I don't care. It's not a matter of how you feel about the pandemic. It's how you feel about the liberty that gives you the life you want. We've given up a lot of it during the pandemic. Maybe it's been worth it, maybe not. But we got to draw a line somewhere, and a federal judge did. Okay, got a couple of minutes left, so let me uh, talk about one more thing because it's so interesting, and that's the Elon Musk purchase of Twitter. I'm not a tweetomaniac or whatever you call people who use Twitter uh, 24 7. I'm a little more interested in it because it's been in the news uh, these days. But um, here's what I'm interested in. Elon Musk likes to say, as I alluded to earlier, that he's a free speech absolutist. What does that mean? Okay, free speech. Anybody can say anything. Now, there are categories of speech that are prohibited and by law, so we have a way to address that. But I agree with it. I agree that even abhorrent, as, not, as long as they're not harmful speech, should be allowed. Why? One, because it's, it's in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, rather. Uh, and two, because, and I wrote this down as I thought about it, so I'm going to pull up my note card, folks. I actually do prepare for these. This is what I think about. Abhorrent speech is enhanced by repression. Allowing abhorrent and incorrect speech to see the light of day over time will wilt it and make it less effective, less convincing. Now, former President Obama said something quite to the contrary, and I haven't been or will be president, but I respectfully disagree. Suppression of speech is dangerous, more dangerous than allowing abhorrent free speech. I really believe that. Anything we su suppress 
will have an implied credibility. This, this speech is so bad, we can't let you hear. Okay, well, we have to have a little more faith in our citizenry and uh, within reason, uh, allow reason. So those are my thoughts for today. I'll remind you uh, that you can find our Figments episodes on the YouTube playlist. I'm gonna give you, give you a minute here to scan those in if you'd like, QR codes. Making a comeback, by the way, QR codes are. Figments, the power of imagination. This show, in for a while, several months, I did Figments on reality, which was all count solo commentary on events of the day. And uh, then more importantly, let me remind you, if you haven't seen, maybe you haven't seen, then it's not a reminder, I'm telling you. It's fun drive time, the spring fun drive or Think Tech Y. This is a great organization, over 20 years old, a true nonprofit, 5013C or seven, whatever that number is. It's a nonprofit, folks. They don't make money. I don't make money, but they ena enable citizen journalists to put together about 30 shows a week, every week, uh, very diverse in topic and viewpoint. And they need your support to continue to succeed. So, that's a wrap on Figments, The Power of Imagination, special edition. I'll close by saying that I'd like you to think of these words, humanity, diplomacy, and liberty, and make sure they're all part of your life. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.